Hi, this is Pastor Daryl Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Friday, April 7th, 2017. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I guess you've seen the news. It's all over the place. You'd have to be asleep or under a rock or on a pretty remote vacation not to have seen it. Pretty big implications here. America striking in Syria. When I saw this yesterday, it was last night, I, was, I hadn't made a video yet, but I had such a busy day and I was just so inundated with things I was doing and working and everything. And I was like, I really need to make a video, but I, I couldn't. I had so much going on, I couldn't possibly, but wow, wow. I mean, just the biblical implications. Now, when you hear what they talk about in regards to this strike, it's not that Trump was trying to uh, invade or occupy or anything like that. And he called the Russians ahead of time, at least according to the stories I've seen, called them ahead of time, say, hey, you might want to relocate your guys because we're about to come in there with some tomahawks. 59 of them, exactly. Um, looks to me like Donald Trump is saying, hey, that chemical attack you did on the women and children, yeah, don't do that again. If you do it again, next time it's going to be a lot worse. Basically, that's what it comes down to. How many lines in the sand did Obama draw? And they crossed, and he did nothing. Oh, you cross this line, and we'll do something. Oh, you cross that line? Well, if you cross this line, then we're going to do something. Trump is saying, hey, guess what? We're doing something. He's a man of action, not just a talker, not a great speaker. He's a man of action. I think with that move, he also put North Korea on alert. Hey, uh, yeah, you might want to rein in your nuclear program, or we're going to take action. Let's have a look at some things going on out of Ynet News. U.S. will take action on Syrian chemical attacks if the U.N. doesn't. U.S. Ambassador Nikki Haley warned that the Trump administration will take action against chemical attacks in Syria that bear all the hallmarks of President Bashar Assad's government if the U.N. Security Council fails to act. That story was published on, uh, let's see, the 6th, yesterday, and then right after that, they took action. That's a man of action right there. Now, I know a lot of people are freaking out, going, wow, Trump's taking us to war. I think Trump is telling Syria, what you did was wrong, and if you do it again, the punishment will be much worse. And I know there's all the conspiracy people going, oh, it's a false flag, so they can do this, it's this, it's that thing. And you know, no matter what you do, there's always going to be those conspiracy theorists. Um, you know, the sun could come up and, oh, false flag, it's a conspiracy thing. Uh, it's not really the sun. <laughs> you know, people like this, everything's a conspiracy. Everything's a false flag. Um... Also out of Ynet News, Netanyahu says to Vladimir Putin, we must complete the effort to cleanse Syria of chemical weapons. You remember back the Gulf War when uh, George Bush went into Iraq to take down Saddam Hussein for the weapons of mass destruction, and they knew then that they moved all the chemical weapons and the weapons of mass destruction into Syria, and everybody was like, yeah, right. Hello, anybody got to come back and say, golly, George Bush was right, wasn't he? He was right, because all those weapons from Iraq ended up in Syria. Syria. Interesting. A lot of things about Syria. You know, the, the Isaiah 17, 1 prophecy against Damascus that says it'll be a ruinous heap. It'll cease to exist as a city. And Paul was on the road to Damascus when that bright light blinded him. And Christ said, why are you persecuting me, Saul? Bright light. Damascus. Maybe that's a foretaste of a very soon coming bright light in Damascus that's going to cause it to be a ruinous heap and cease to exist as a city. Interesting. I'm, I'm still thinking it's either going to be a nuclear strike on Damascus or a God strike on Damascus, but I can tell you this, Isaiah 17, 1, prophecy against Damascus will come to pass, and I think we're seeing it knocking on the door right now. And I know, I've been saying that for the last seven years, 
since this Syrian war. But what's seven years to God? I mean, the Bible says a thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. It will happen. And I just hope and pray that when people see Damascus destroyed, they'll be like, wait, that was in the Bible. And that was written like over 3,000 years ago. Maybe some of this other stuff is true too. Yeah, like the fact that Jesus is the Son of God and he died on a cross to save you and he rose again from the dead and he's coming back again. Um, uh, Syria's foreign minister denies country used chemical weapons. The Syrian foreign ministry is categorically denying his government used chemical weapons in the attack this week in Idlib province or in any other attack. It says the Syrian army has never used chemical weapons and will not use chemical weapons against Syrians and even against terrorists. Well, somebody used them. Pretty clear. Somebody used them. We've all seen the footage. We've all seen the outcome. Uh, dozens dead, hundreds injured. Out of the Weekly Standard, Trump National Security Team all agreed on Syria's strike. Yesterday, or Wednesday, the National Security Council convened in the White House with President Trump in the chair to discuss how the United States would respond to Bashar al-Assad. Just a couple of hours earlier, in a press conference in the Rose Garden, Trump had denounced in strong terms the Tuesday chemical weapons attack by Assad on the Syrian strongman's own people. I now have responsibility, and I will have that responsibility and carry it very proudly, the President said. And just hours later... 59 Tomahawk missiles landed at that airbase, targeting aircraft, hardened aircraft shelters, petroleum and logistical storage, ammunition supply bunkers, air defense systems, and radars. There was no immediate casualties to the Syrian forces or those of Assad's ally, Russia. Of course, the Russian forces were notified in advance of the strike using established deconfliction line. Huh. Not even sure what all that means. Warning, Russia. Hey, we're about to strike Syria, so you might want to get your guys out. Very interesting. Again, I think this sends a strong message to Iran, to North Korea. Hey, guess what? There's a new president in the White House. You cross a red line, we're going to bomb you. You do something against innocent women, children, and civilians, we're going to punish you. We're not going to sit back. We're not going to watch from the sidelines and slap your hands. Out of the New York Times, banned nerve agent sarin used in Syria chemical attacks, Turkey says. Poison used in this deadly attack was the banned nerve agent sarin, says the Turkish health minister in a statement. Um, he says, according to the results of preliminary tests, patients were exposed to sarin. Chemical material, pretty clear from what we're seeing. Sarin gas, a banned substance. Out of Breitbart, Iran is the wild card following U.S. airstrikes in Syria. How's the Muslim and Arab world going to react to this? See, that's the thing. Iran must be monitored carefully for the possibility it might use its proxies for retaliation, Hezbollah, especially against Israel's northern border. How will Iran respond? Could this possibly be the catalyst that will cause Iran to fulfill Ezekiel 38-39 and lead a world army against Israel? Now you might be saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, that was America that struck in Syria, why would they come after Israel? <laughs> you think Iran or any other Muslim country really needs an excuse to attack Israel? I mean, they're there. That's the biggest reason they need. They're there. Israel is there in this land that God gave them. That's the biggest reason the Arabs and Muslims want to attack Israel, because they exist in a land that God gave them. That makes the devil angry. So you know those who follow him are angry too. Um, Iran. Hmm. Very interesting. Again, I think 
the message that Trump just sent with this Syrian strike sends a message to North Korea and Iran. Hey, we're not messing around. You do something that goes against the rules, we're going to hit you. Out of Times of Israel, Israeli leaders offer wall-to-wall -wall praise for U.S. strike on Syria. It's interesting. I've been in the Golan Heights looking out over the land of Syria, watching the smoke rise. I heard the bombs and missiles. I heard machine guns. I could, I could hear the war when I was in Israel a couple of years ago. Very interesting. Um, Israeli leaders welcome the strong and important message sent by the United States strike on a Syrian regime airfield overnight. Of course, the IDF was informed by the United States ahead of the strike. These 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles launched from two American naval destroyers in the eastern Mediterranean. Hmm. Wow. You know, the Middle East has a lot of Bible prophecies that are going to happen in that area. Um, 59 Tomahawk precision guided missiles. Um, the base that was hit in Syria had two squadrons of Syria's Su-22 ground attack aircraft. and They were used to carry out that April 4th chemical attack that killed at least 88 civilians. This number is up to at least. Um, I like how Donald Trump said no child of God should have to suffer something like this. Child of God. How many times did we even hear that phrase, child of God, in the last eight years in the White House? Um, of course, Syria calls this strike an act of aggression. Well, I think it was a retaliation saying, hey, you can't do that. You can't use chemical weapons. And, and the sad thing is you can't bomb a chemical weapons factory because then all the chemicals would be released and would kill thousands, if not millions. Um, and what's going to happen with United States and Russia relations? I mean... This is the first direct military action the United States has taken against Assad's regime. Their, their civil war, was it seven years now it's been lasting? Or is it six years? I lose track. Um, it's six or seven years that Syria has been at civil war. And the, the official tally is over 400,000 deaths, but I mean, that's the ones they know of. That number's probably doubled from all the mass graves that they don't know about. Some six million people have been displaced. Five million Syrians have left the country. Um, this attack looks to me like it's a warning to Syria. Don't use chemical weapons again. You cross that line, we hit you, don't cross it again. Next time it's going to hurt worse. Um... These were surface-to-air. Uh, United States did not target Syria's surface-to-air missile sites. So these strikes were clearly not um, a preparation for larger airstrikes by jets. This all feels so biblical. You know, the Bible tells us to defend those who can't defend themselves. The use of chemical weapons can't become normal. Civilized people can't grow indifferent to these kind of attacks. In Psalm 82, 3 through 4, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Seems to me Donald Trump is doing some good things. Now, you're probably saying, wait, Daryl, he, he bombed Syria. No deaths in this bombing. It was an airfield that carried out strikes against civilians. I'm sure the runway got pummeled. They probably can't take off from that runway. I think justice needs to be sought for those who oppress the innocent. I mean, these images of this gas attack are horrible. Wicked will not go unpunished. Proverbs 11:21. God's word instructs us to seek justice, correct oppression, Bring justice to the fatherless, Isaiah 1.17. Interesting, numbers transposed from 
Isaiah 17, 1. We need to pray for our leaders, pray for our military, those in authority. We're told to intercede for all who are in high positions, 1 Timothy 2, verse 2. Our leaders, our president, they need divine wisdom. Those who serve in our military deserve to have our intercession and our prayers and support. We need to ask God how he wants us to respond to this. You know, in Matthew 9, Jesus asked the disciples to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. And then the very next verse shows how they helped answer their prayer. And he called to him, his 12 disciples, and gave them authority over unclean spirits. These 12 that Jesus sent out. Hmm. You know, these families in Syria, they need support. They need help. They need financial support. They need prayers. They need blankets. They need water. They need food. They're in a horrible situation in this war-torn country. You know, God loves the Syrian people. The church at Antioch of Syria was, was Paul's base for his missionary ministry to the rest of the world. The Syrian church is one of the oldest in the world. And God always sides with innocent victims of oppression. Jeremiah 22, verse 3. Syria definitely needs our prayers. What do you think about this strike? Um, 59 cruise missiles. That's an interesting number. Uh, I think the speed of the strike is fairly impressive. From the moment they decided to do this until the moment it was done, it was less than 24 hours. How many times have we seen presidents past take weeks and months to even do something? 59. Russian Su-22s and MiG-23s were destroyed in this strike. Um, and I think Kim Jong-un is probably like, wow, that was a little excessive. Hmm. <laughs> I think it's a warning. I think even Vladimir Putin might be like, whoa, Trump means business, doesn't he? He means business. Um, I don't know. Very interesting. It, it, it all seems quite biblical to me. I mean, so many things spoken of in Syria. Out of Ynet News, Bashar Assad says Israel is aiding terrorists. Really? Really, Bashar Assad, Israel's aiding terrorists? I think, Bashar Assad, you're acting like a terrorist. Not even going to read the rest of that story. So, let me know your thoughts. I, I find it all very biblical, what's going on over there. So many people think otherwise, but... How about this, how the Times of Israel, Russia recognizes West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. One of the first countries in the world to say, hey, we recognize West Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Of course, they didn't stop there. They went on to say, yeah, with East Jerusalem being a Palestinian capital. Ah, okay. So here's Russia already saying, I'm recognizing your divided capital. You know, the Bible speaks that God will fight against those who fight against Jerusalem, that God will punish those who seek to divide his land. And here's Russia saying, yeah, we're dividing it already for you. We recognize West Jerusalem as Israel's capital and East Jerusalem as Palestine's capital. There you go. Russia. Russia's a big player in end time events. Don't believe me, read Daniel 7, verse 5. The bear that was told to devour much flesh. And for those of you who think Israel is an apartheid state, please read this story out of the Times of Israel. Israel appoints its first female Muslim diplomat. Hello? The foreign ministry appointed Rasha Atamni, 31, to represent the Jewish state in Ankara, Turkey, making her Israel's first female Muslim diplomat. Apartheid? Please. Moving on. 
Out of Newsweek, ISIS executes 33 in Syria, its largest mass killing of mass killing of 2017. They killed ISIS killed 33 people in eastern Syria on Wednesday, its biggest mass killing so far this year. Between killed 33 between the ages of 18 and 25 years old. Oh boy. I wonder how ISIS feels about that attack. Hmm. Out of Times of Israel, a U.S. State Department designates Hamas commander a global terrorist. Well, yeah. Um, out of news.com, uh, North Korea vows most ruthless, most, most ruthless blow on United States after Donald Trump pledges to build up defenses against Pyongyang. North Korea ready to deliver a ruthless blow if provoked by the United States. If provoked by the United States, here's North Korea testing ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and nuclear detonations. And America's provoking them? <laughs> okay. Let's get into the word today. It's it's been an interesting day. In Matthew 7, in verse 13, Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets. You'll know them by their fruits. Gotta love the words of Jesus. You know, when it comes to a person's eternal destiny, there's only two choices. You know, and there's only two, two choices in life. You can live by the tolerance of society or you can live by the truth of Jesus Christ. I think it's important. Uh, it's more important than ever because the choice, there's countless thousands of people who believe there are many ways to get to heaven, that all roads lead to God. But Jesus wasn't some new age guru who gave people options on how to get to heaven. He said there's only two roads for us to choose. We can either choose the broad popular path that leads to destruction that many will be on or the narrow path that leads to everlasting life. I like how it's a broad road, but a narrow path. Um, the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. You know, look at the Tower of Babel in, uh, what was that, Genesis 11. It's a great example of the broad road that leads to destruction. It was built in order to give mankind a new and better way to get to God, you know, to get closer to God. And just like the people who were building that tower in Babel, a lot of people today think that salvation is some kind of modern-day expressway that you can get on or off of whenever you want and, and pick the lane you want. But Jesus said the road to heaven is the narrow road of faith in him, not the broad road that many will be on. You see, the same deception that was alive and well in ancient Babylon is still alive and well, even right here in America today. But the road to heaven is still the same road. God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. The road to God, the way to God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it only goes through the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God the Father but by me. The road is narrow that leads to heaven. And we need to help others find it because most of them are on that broad road heading to destruction. In Philippians 2, verse 13, it says, For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. To will and to do. Um, I think in every life there's this, this sense of insufficiency that comes through from time to time. But if we have the Holy Spirit, we have the power to fight against that. You know, like a lot of the insufficient but perfectly willing saints who have gone on before us, we can turn that inadequate feeling into victory. 
first we need to acknowledge our weakness. I mean, acknowledging your weaknesses, it's important. It's biblical. Uh, think about it like this. You know, if, if a neighbor walks across the yard and he tells you about his sister's life-threatening disease, you know, they're, they're, they're scared, they're anxious, wondering what comes after death, and you can feel God kind of speaking to your heart, you know, urging you to explain that his saving grace is available to this man, to this man's sister. But you don't feel adequately prepared to share. You know, feeling unsure is a, a, a normal human reaction. And following the voice of the Holy Spirit's unction and leading requires that we acknowledge our fear. You know, you might need to pray, Lord, I don't feel capable of witnessing to my neighbor. Please help me feel capable. Or give me the words to say, Father. I don't feel adequately prepared with my vocabulary to share the good news of Jesus Christ. You need to pray for strength. Say, Father, I, I know this is what you want me to do, so I'm trusting you to be true to your word. You said you would make me adequate in Christ Jesus. I mean, God assumes responsibility for enabling you to know what to say, how to say it, and the spirit in which to deliver the message. We have to lean upon God, not lean upon our own abilities or inabilities, which is usually the case. And we need to step out in faith. You know, do something that propels you to be in these God-given opportunities more frequently. Allow God to prove his power and his ability when you rely on him. You know, let God turn your inadequacy into victory. I think he delights in proving himself in the lives of his children, his servants. We need to look beyond our own limitations and look to the complete and total sufficiency of Jesus Christ. You see, it's not about us. It's all about him. It's only when you realize that that you can live with the joy and the confidence, even when you're aware of our own failures and shortcomings. So here we are coming upon the time known as the Passover, getting closer and closer to Easter. You know, most people, I say most people, I think most people have heard that Jesus Christ died for our sins. But what does that really mean? Why was his death the way that God planned for it to happen? Um, how does Christ's death reflect God's holy festivals? Hmm. You know, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross, I think, is the main event in God's plan for saving humanity, for saving mankind. You know, Jesus prophesied the fact he'd be lifted up in crucifixion so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, John 3, 14 through 16. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, this is actually the central message of the Passover. This was a, a supreme act of love for all of mankind. This important event laid the foundation for the annual festivals that would follow. It's one of the most momentous steps in God's plan for, for humans. Just before the Passover feast that would see his execution, Jesus said that for this purpose I came to this hour, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. John 12, 27, and John 12, 32. If you think about it, the day that this event happened, the day the crucifixion happened, transpired on the 14th day of the first month of God's calendar, the very same day on which the Passover lambs were to be slain, according to Leviticus 23, verse 5. Hmm. Even Paul would later tell the congregation at Corinth that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. I mean, think about it. If you go back to the Old Testament, God... Um, through Moses, told Pharaoh, let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Exodus 5, verse 1. 
And then God sent a series of plagues displaying his incredible power, and he delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. After nine plagues, he gave Israel specific instructions about the next and final plague, calamity, and the steps that each Israelite family would have to take in order to not be hit by this plague. God said that on the 10th day of the first month, which is in the spring in the Middle East, the Israelites were to select a lamb or a goat large enough to feed each household, Exodus 12, verse 3. This animal uh, was to be a, a, a year, like a year old male with no defects. And on the 14th day of that month, in the evening, the Israelites were to kill these animals and place some of the blood on the doorposts of their home. The animals were, were then to be roasted and eaten along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Okay, this is all in the Bible. You can follow along. Then God further instructed the Israelites on that evening that he would kill all the firstborn of Egypt to convince Pharaoh to release the Israelites from slavery because Pharaoh's heart was hardened. The firstborn of each of the Israelite family would be protected if the sign of the blood was on the entrance of their homes. You see, God would pass over their homes to spare them. So this is the meaning of the name of this observance, Exodus 12, verse 13. When, when the Spirit saw that blood on the doorpost, he would pass over that house and not take the firstborn. God said this day would be to the Israelites a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance, Exodus 12, verse 14. This annual Passover observance symbolized Jesus Christ. Um, I mean, Paul referred to Christ as our Passover, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. And the Apostle John recorded that uh, John the Baptist recognized Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, John 1, verse 29. Unblemished male represented Jesus Christ as perfect, the sinless sacrifice who died in our place. I mean, his death paid the penalty for our sins and reconciles us to God the Father. Hebrews 9, 11 through 12, tells us that Christ came as a high priest of his own good things to come, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, Jesus Christ bought us with his blood. You were bought at a price. He poured out his blood, his life, as our Passover lamb, so our sins could be forgiven. So you see, Jesus had to die because in this way, God could mercifully forgive our sins while maintaining his integrity of his law and his perfect justice. The Bible tells us that sin is the violation of God's law of love. 1 John 3, verse 4. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. And we've each earned the death penalty for our disobedience. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. Jesus Christ gave up his life on our behalf. Romans 5, verses 6 through 8. See, we would all be doomed if our sins hadn't been paid for by Jesus Christ. Christ, who lived a life without sin, he lived a perfect life as the unblemished Lamb of God. He substituted his death for our own. His death was the only possible substitution for ours. His sacrifice became the payment for our sins. He died in our place so we could share life with him for eternity. See, we can no longer live according to our own selfish lusts and desires. We've become God's redeemed. We were bought and paid for. We're God's possession, actually. Bought in blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Passover is to continue as a Christian observance. Jesus and Paul made this clear. Jesus himself specified elements of the Passover meal that must still be ceremonially partaken. So Christian's important truths about himself and God's continuing plan of salvation will keep going. This Passover sacrifice foreshadowed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Hmm. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. 
Jesus spoke of specific instructions concerning the Passover ceremony. Um, the events of Jesus last evening with his disciples in John 13, 1 through 5, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come and he should depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During that meal, Jesus rose from the supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Washing the feet of another, that was something a lowly servant did. 1 Samuel 25, verse 41. Jesus was teaching them a lesson here. He washed their feet. He said, do you know what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. He reminded them of the importance of humble service to others. This reinforced another lesson he gave them in Matthew 20, verse 25 through 28, where he told the disciples about the wrong and right kind of leadership. Lord it over you. Let him be your servant. Uh, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Washing the feet. He said, I've given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. John 13, 15. So how many Christians today do you think follow the example of Jesus Christ and obey his simple instructions to wash each other's feet, to have that kind of attitude in their lives and their service to others? We should be devoted to following God and serving our fellow man. Hmm. Christ, the sacrificial offering for our sins. We've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10, verses 10 through 14. I think there's a lot of people that need to know more about Jesus. They need to hear more about Jesus, by whose stripes we've been healed. Isaiah prophesied of Jesus' suffering in Isaiah 53. Um, Jesus helped people who were demon-possessed. He cured the blind, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he cast out demons. He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. You know, sin brings suffering, but Christ made it possible for us to have everlasting life through the forgiveness of our sins. He said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Christ is our Passover. We should understand that through baptism and accepting Christ, we're no longer slaves of sin, but we walk in the newness of life. Hmm. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2, verse 20. Hmm. We need to make sure that we are faithfully serving Christ and he finds us faithfully serving when he returns. The blood of Christ completely covers our sins. It makes it possible to have our guilt and our sins removed. And we can now boldly come to the throne of God with our prayers and petitions. It's all by the blood. This is my blood of the new covenant, Matthew 26, verse 27, 28. Blood of the new covenant. Hmm. Covenant relations. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds, and I will write them, he adds. Their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more, Hebrews 10, 16 and 17. So as you think of the coming week and the time of Easter when we celebrate the resurrected Savior, don't forget the Passover part either that we're commanded to observe.
And just like the spirit in that day in Egypt passed over the doors of those who had the blood of the Lamb, in the same way, these destructive spirits today will pass over the houses of those who have the blood of the Lamb on their doors. Not literal, but it's the blood of Christ that saves you. Keep that in mind. I love you guys. Have a great weekend. Please go worship our Lord and Savior somewhere. Take somebody with you. And good Lord willing, I'll see you again on Monday.